You're listening to the Yoga Medicine Podcast. I'm your host, Tiffany Cruikshank. Our podcast brings you information and resources to enhance the therapeutic effects of your practice based on a deeper understanding of anatomy, physiology, and the integration of modern science and research with traditional practices and experiences. Join me and my co-hosts, Rachel Land and Katya Barch, as we dive into all things yoga, research, and wellness. We are back and excited to talk on a topic. I feel like this topic always draws a lot of interest. Anything around female health and hormones, I think, is a hot topic these days. And and always, I'm glad it's becoming more of a hot topic because traditionally speaking, a lot of research is revolves around males because their hormones are easier. <laughs> they don't have all the changes to deal with. And so typically, it's just easier to do studies on them. Um we talk a lot about the details of the female cycle in our female health teacher training. We go through all of the details of hormonal changes and ways to support those hormonal, hormonal changes throughout the cycle, as well as the phases of our lives. Um, from a yoga standpoint in that training, really aimed at teachers. So if you want more details on that, know that you can check that out. We also have a training on um, yoga for athletes and how to train tissues in that context. So this one kind of, I think, brings both of those two fields together. If you've done one or both of those, um, it'll be really interesting. And if not, I think there'll be a lot of tidbits in here for you to experiment with. And then if you want more details, you can check into one of those on our website at yogamedicine.com. Um, as well as an episode that you've done, I wasn't on. <laughs> Do you that was a good one. Yeah. Yeah, I I do. We we actually we did one as well. We did a, a research roundup on female hormones talking through the cycle how the hormones are changing. That was number 48. You were on that one. But we also did another one oh, yes. with Laura yeah, with Laura <laughs> Philip. Yeah. Uh, so that was number 22. And Laura Phillip, for those of you who don't know her, she's an elite triathlete, really one of the best in the world. She's won multiple Ironman races, I believe 18, 70.3 Ironman races. And she recently also came in third um, at the Ironman World Championships in Hawaii. And she is a huge proponent in the field of sports, endurance sports, of training in accordance with your cycle. So within one menstrual cycle, she will not just go through her training for the whole month, but she actively adjusts her training to the different phases, to the different different hormonal states, and she also actively tracks her training. And I think she's she's one of the athletes who do that, but it's recently really become more popular. It's been spoken of more. And in, in practice, especially in endurance sports, but I also feel in other fields, this has gained a lot more attention. Yeah, absolutely. So those are great episodes to refer back to for more context. We're going to jump into a really specific study that um, that is really interesting because it takes a new perspective on this. For those of you who are familiar with it, or even if you're just new to this, this um, information, I think a really interesting one to look at and, you know, maybe placing some context about prior research, just really briefly. <laughs> It's just hard to I'm, do. <laughs> I'm trying my best. Yeah. So the the cycle based training that Laura Philip and others are applying or referring to is based on a couple of assumptions and a couple of scientific findings. So one of them is that it is um, assumed, or there are findings that point towards the fact that when we have high levels of estrogen in our bodies which is typically the case around ovulation, for instance, that our muscle power is increased. So how the muscle cells work and how they contract is changed or can be changed. So your muscle output might actually better during ovulation or around ovulation, for instance. But also we have other findings that have more implications for um, going through your cycle as well. For instance, that our fascial tissues, our collagen tissues change throughout the cycle as well. And for instance, with high estrogen, again, around the ovul uh, ovulatory phase, we know that the tissue can become a bit softer, a bit laxer, and that can have 
positive impacts on range of motion if that's what you need in your sport but also in some other scenarios it might set you up for a bit more instability so really depending on what your sport is and what your requirements are there those could be implications to be taken into your training regimen or setting and that's what different sports have done with with those findings that was a and really you, quick one there are a lot yeah. of other things going on with your temperature with your calorie um, calorie consumption with water retention, a lot of other things are going on as well, but yeah. those were just a couple of highlights there. Yeah. And I think you can already, already get a sense that it's going to be very individualized, but really we're looking at what we know so far, the research, as you and I have talked about it, and as we know, is like very limited and however, there are implications that there might be some increased muscle power around this ovulation with an increased estrogen and there might be stiffer or less stiff tissues. So there might be more of this elasticity or range of motion available around ovulation, which might be better or worse for certain individuals, depending on their sport, depending on their predisposition already. Um, and again, these studies are limited. Like, like you mentioned, you know, the muscle power one was on postmenopausal women on estrogen. So we have limited information, but this is what the information is suggesting so far is that estrogen is definitely probably having an effect on both the muscle tissue and the connective tissue that surrounds it and encases it. Um, and so that's just setting the context for where we're going. Now we're going to look at a study that kind of takes a little different approach, which I think is interesting to keep in mind because we females, we're complex. <laughs> Hormones make things a little more complicated and you know, we just have to respect that and appreciate it. Yeah. And I'm really enthusiastic about the fact that the research also reflects more complexity of the hum human or female form as well. So there's actually a handful of studies that came out in the last two years. So 2022, 2023, that are looking at this at a little bit of a different angle. And this is is great because we we finally get a bit more depth in the research but this one is also going to be interesting because it might have different angle or a different um yeah perspective on that yeah so this one we're going to look at a very specific study which is fun i like to get to kind of dive in deep to one and and you know we've got the the context of what the previous research has kind of hinted to on previous episodes. Um, but why don't you take us into the study specifically that we're going to look at yeah. with links, obviously in the show notes. So, mm -hmm. so this one has been carried out in Denmark by a group of researchers around Mette Hansen. So that group of researchers really has published a number of studies on female hormones and they have really done that for a while. So it's, it's also to be seen, not as a single study, but in the context, context of all the work that they've been doing and they've gained a lot of um, competence with, with researching in that field. And they looked at females, a number of females, and wanted to see if their performance throughout the cycle really did change or fluctuate with the change and fluctuation of the sex hormones that are circulating in the system. So um, mainly estrogen and pr progesterone, but they also measured um, testosterone levels in the blood. And then they saw that, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to mm -hmm. give one of the main findings away right away. So the phases of lower performance, we're going to look at that in, in a bit more depth in a second, but when those females performed a little less throughout the cycle, that could actually not be explained by their fluctuations of sex hormones. So that was not correlated significantly, but they found other factors. And, and just to be I'm, clear, I'm going to leave that says, cliffhanger. <laughs> performed less, we're talking about lower performance. So, and yeah. I think maybe, um, oh yeah, if you wanted to speak to that next, you could go to something else. Sorry, I don't want to break your train of thought. <laughs> no, 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 that's that's a perfect... Um, not perfect, less performing uh, time, but actually lower performance. No, I guess lower that. performance. Yeah. yeah. So, and actually the 
the types of performance they were measuring in the study were, were a couple of different things. So they did measure grip strength, they measured um, biceps strength, and so those more muscle-oriented strength parameters they actually looked at because it's assumed that during ovulation or when estrogen is higher, muscle output is, is higher as well. So that's why they looked at that. But they also looked at um, jump heights. So they did counter movement jumps, for instance. So kind of bending your knees a little bit and then jumping as high as you can. So somewhat of a explosive jump performance they they considered. And also they did um, a cycling test that reflected more of the endurance capacity or anaerobic capacity to be more specific. Awesome. Yeah. And looking at a variation of things or a variety of things, which I think is really interesting in this one. Yeah. And also that's, that's going to be important as well. They, they looked at untrained women. Yeah. So I'm going to come back to that later, but that's also interesting to note and important to know as well. They did look at untrained females. Um, one, one funny side note, um, which especially having having that context maybe in the US where I feel people do not cycle as much as a means of transportation, at least in, in many areas. Um, they did allow for these untrained women to cycle up to 70 kilometers per week. So that's 50 miles, I believe, per week as a means of transportation that was still considered untrained because it's just <laughs> used so much to cycle in Denmark as a means of transportation. That's why women who cycled yeah. to that amount or that um, distance were still allowed in the study. But other than that, they were untrained women. And do you want to, do you want me yeah, to keep going to go into the results and into the details there yet? Well, I think it is interesting to think about who it is. Like, I mean, it was, I think 40 people is, was what they had. And I think that's a, that's a substantial number. It's not huge, but it's, it's decent. It's reasonable. Yeah. And they did like, in research, you always pre-calculate how many people you need in order to um, reach a certain effect size. So that's more the statistical part of it that is probably not as interesting on this podcast, but <laughs> it's not a random number they pick, but they statistically yeah. calculate before and give a lot of thought about how many women they include. So it's a, it's a, it's a well-done research study with all the appropriate um, considerations that are being done before. And they and, clearly tried to stay away from menopause because they had ages 18 mm -hmm. to 35 or perimenopause, let's say. They tried to avoid that because that would obviously be challenging, I'm assuming. Yeah. And they even checked uh, in the blood levels, for instance, they even excluded a couple of women that did not reach the normal progesterone level. So even if they were mm. ovulating, but if, if a certain progesterone amount that is being considered to be within normal range did not occur... Um, they they excluded them from the study. So there are a lot of considerations. Um, yeah. We can chat later a little bit also about how complex it really is to do research on females. There are so many things to consider. Right. That's why it makes it so complex. And that's why um, we haven't had a lot of great research on females and female athletes in the past, but that's just one little aspect to consider as well. So many, many, many different um, aspects they, they had to look at and methodologically had to make sure. Yeah. So those and hopefully women they sent them home with like a little progesterone or some herbs or something. <laughs> Probably not. <laughs> I'm kidding. Maybe, maybe we need you. Here's at your the, lunch bag. Website. <laughs> Thank you for coming. <laughs> we wish you well. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. It would have been, I, my point is it's an interesting piece of information they got to go home with at least hopefully they can yeah. go do something with it. Anyways, I'm getting distracted. Yeah, I'm I like that you're getting it. distracted, though. I'm excited um, because... for them finding it. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, what to do with that info, right? Like, um, that's a, a very other route to go <laughs> with this podcast. Like, what do you what do you do with some of the findings you might be exposed to when you participate in a research study? But a different a different route to take. So those women, um, in their mid thirties, uh, up until their up until their mid thirties, participated in the study. 
And they did those performance tests. And actually, they did them quite often, seven to nine times in the menstrual cycle. So they were That's tested great. every couple of days. And they looked at one menstrual cycle. So one menstrual cycle and then multiple tests of all the parameters that they looked at throughout that month or throughout that cycle. And they did not only, and now it's getting really interesting, they did not only look at the different levels of hormones throughout the cycle, which they repeatedly measured, but they also assessed certain psychological parameters. They did that mainly with questionnaires. So for instance, they asked them about their motivation for this upcoming test of their grip strength and cycle performance and so on. And they also asked them how they themselves per perceived their performance mm. level on that day. So they also checked for their own expectation, which we know from psychological research can play a huge role in psychological studies or contexts. So I love that they assessed that as well. And they also checked, for instance, for their state of arousal, for their state of pleasure. So kind of how, how well they're feeling in general. So they also assess that. And it's known that those sensations or those states can also fluctuate throughout the cycle. So they measured that every day or every time they did those sports performance tests, they also measured those um, psychological parameters as well. Which is why I think one of the reasons why you and I love this one, because it was really thorough. I mean, it's hard to be that thorough, as we mentioned before, when you're looking at females and there's a lot of moving parts. So hats off to them. What a, what a great, interesting piece of information they've given us here. Absolutely. And now I think let's let's really get the, the juice out of that. So what they mm -hmm. found was that there were actually some performance fluctuations throughout the month. Interestingly, not for the muscle strength parameters. So not for the grip strength, not for the bicep strength. That seemed to be rather stable throughout the menstrual cycle. But they did find that at the end of the cycle and in the very early phase of bleeding, so in the late luteal and early follicular phase, that the jump performance and the cycle performance, they were a bit lower than in the other phases of the cycle. So towards the end of the cycle and towards the start of the bleeding phase, those performance parameters were actually a little bit lower. And now, of course, comes the very interesting question. Did that have to do with the changes in sex hormones that we can see during those times in the cycle or did they have to do some uh, did they have to do with something else and as i already hinted at or, or already gave away those performance changes were actually not explained by the fluctuations of the female sex hormones that they also measured but they um were explained or could be explained by those psychological factors of yeah um, yeah we could call them well-being so the motivation like their own their own assessment or their own perceived performance level and then also arousal and state of pleasure so those were the factors that could explain or were correlated with those performance changes so interesting because i mean that's that's the point of the cycle where the hormones are, are the lowest, you know, the hormones all drop down there. The um, So an interesting thing too, though, that hasn't been taken into consideration is that psychological well-being. And, and for me, as, as like, you, I feel like you live on the more research side and I live more on the clinical side, though we both do some, um, we both kind of have a little bit of both, but um, I think, you know, perhaps on the, the, experiential on the clinical side is there's also potentially maybe more so of this. It'd be interesting to see more, more studies around this too, to see if this was more pronounced when there were like painful periods or PMS or inflammation around the period time too. And as it would make a lot of sense, right. As those psychological markers are maybe changing their performance, if that's yeah, the but case, it I'm assuming. Yeah. But it's, it's an interesting thing that you're mentioning because now we're getting 
right into the details of the research. And that's <laughs> why it's so fascinating to really do take a deep dive. Because if we look at the inclusion criteria for research studies like this, they do typically mm. not allow women into the study or females into the study that experience very heavy bleeding or cramps. So that's pain. Most Would pain and PMS be exclusions too? Um, I would have to look in detail into the study. I don't, <laughs> Sorry. I, in this case, in this case, they did assess pain as well. So I do not think that they um, excluded, excluded painful yeah. periods. I think you'd exclude a lot in, of people if you excluded everyone with PMS and painful periods. I don't think you'd have a lot left in that, especially in that yeah. like early thirties and twenties phase of life, you know? <laughs> yeah. I mean, they do, they do typically exclude menstrual cycle dysfunctions but it yeah. then always depends on what they define as menstrual cycle dysfunctions but those might be the ones who have the biggest effect or that for them it might be even more important because it might play an even bigger role for their performance so that's one thing for the future for sure that would have to be taken into consideration as well and um, experts in the field of female exercise physiology um, are pointing that out exactly that's one of the yeah. points where they say well we need we need more research we're enthusiastic about everything that has come out and is coming out as we, we need speak, more but we need even more right yeah. and you know it is it is interesting because like these are all the details like i love that we can have these conversations in real time too because you've looked through the study more detail than i have and um it, it is interesting because you know, there's so many moving parts here to look at. It is really complicated. And so, yeah, I mean, if they're measuring pain skills, they probably have some level of pain. However, a lot of times women who have like really significant PMS also have low progesterone. So maybe they have already been weeded out somewhat. Who knows? Again, this is like a, this is an initial study, right? So hopefully people will keep looking and maybe there's a study that looks at people with painful periods in particular or PMS in particular, um, if the research continues, I'm sure it must continue to evolve and grow around this. <laughs> we love, we love that evolution, don't we? Yeah. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm fully with you. It is very complex and I personally love that challenge to kind of un unravel some of that complexity or get behind that. Um, but it, it truly is studying the female cycle and how that has implications for training and for performance is really, really complex. And I think that's why we're doing episodes like this as well, just to make sure that not every headline or every trend that is out there is always, um, is, can, can always just be taken as like, you cannot look at one study and then deduct yeah. that that's the truth for everyone and also for all time because luckily as i said those more maybe conflicting findings or more critical studies they have come out very recently and that's great but we also need to look into the details because sometimes those let's say conflicting findings or findings that question that um concept of tracking your cycle and training with your cycle they they also have limitations so it's not black or white not it's not going in one or the other direction. It, it really has a lot of nuance and that's why we chat about it here. Well, and it makes sense too, because, you know, we mentioned really briefly earlier that the, the studies on increased muscle power with estrogen exposure around ovulation was linked to postmenopausal women on estrogen therapy. So, you know, who knows what all the implications are in different phases of our cycle yet. Again, it's important to keep in mind that this is one study um, but I think it really just, it does make sense as a female for most of us, I think right before the period and at the beginning of the period for most people is a time when we're not super excited to go out and, and PR and do our best. You know, I think this is why when we talk about this again, in greater detail on the, the other episodes on the cycle and in our female health training um, but it is really important because this is a time when we shed the lining of the uterus. So finding movement that people can do that's accessible, you know, it, it just becomes a little more challenging if you have a race that day. <laughs> yeah. And it, it can be a silver lining though, because we can see here that the, the 
sex hormones themselves do not or could not maybe have such a big impact on on your performance so you can mm. still go out there on race day on these phases or in these phases of the menstrual cycle and potentially perform to your best um and maybe have some some tools in your toolbox to to work with that psychological load or that different psychological scenario you might experience in the early days of your bleeding phase or in the late days of your luteal phase. So that's also something that I feel is part of cycle tracking. It's not just tracking on which day of the cycle I am, but in my phone and I have, I don't have a fancy app, but I do have just my regular phone app where I'm tracking my cycle and for a while now I have a very clear pattern but for a while I also tracked like other symptoms and those can be psychological and then if you know what to expect and if you know you have a little dip in motivation or in pleasure and arousal or if you perceive your own performance level um, a little bit differently around those days I can work with that if I know that and Mm -hmm. um, I know that biologically maybe or on a hormonal end I don't have to fear so much, let's say, um, or I don't have to expect a big drop in performance that I can use that to my advantage as well. And many, many athletes have shown that they have great or show great performance on those days of their menstrual cycle. So it doesn't necessarily need to be a limitation. Yeah, And I think it's very important that we make a distinction between performance output on a given singular day and training with the cycle. I think those are two very different things and experts in the field also on the practical side are stressing that and and have been stressing that for a while. I love that. I love the silver lining because it is it is really important, right? And and to notice those things, I think to me this is a lot of the yoga too, the non-judgmental attention to notice like, oh, hey, I am feeling this sort of way and oh, it is this time of my cycle. So you know, maybe this is something I can just acknowledge and welcome. And instead of like, I think we spend so much time kind of fighting these things and trying to fix them and work against them. And, and though, of course, there's a bigger picture to this. And sometimes hormones are telling us a story of something that we can support in another way. Um, it can also just be a way of listening and sensing that there are fluctuations to our cycle, that we're not robots moving through our cycle in exactly the same way every day that, that we can kind of embrace those. And that, you know, there's more to it than just our hormones, that the, it is a psychological, psychological changes that can come too, and that we can also welcome those, um, with this non-judgmental attention that hopefully comes from a yoga practice as well, that being able to listen and not have to change or understand that ability to observe and not necessarily have to intervene. (laughs) I think, which is also a really good parenting (laughs) support too, (laughs) especially when they're teenagers. (laughs) (laughs) Or very little. Um, Then you start to watch the hormones (laughs) on the other (laughs) hand, which is even harder. (laughs) Um. Yeah, I, I love that about that study. It just represents that we're not just our homo- hormones, but we're really complex human beings. And it just once again um, points out or points to the fact that the nervous system is just such an important one in our daily lives, but also in sports performance. And I think that's where yoga can play such a like such a such an important role and pivotal role in in the regimen and the training regimen of of an athlete because we have so many tools and so many possibilities to approach the nervous system with yoga and be very consciously do and i think that's a great gateway for female athletes to experience and work with the nervous system specifically the autonomic nervous system throughout um, the cycle as well so tailor your own yoga and mindfulness and and pranayama or breath work um, plan along with with your maybe more physical training so it's kind of like getting getting a training plan for your nervous system as well throughout your month right and i mean 
we're really kind of brushing over a lot of the details here purposefully because there's a lot more to this. There are, I think, just a nod to we're talking about yoga supporting training, but there's so many ways that that can happen. And in other episodes and in our teacher training on yoga for athletes, we talk, I think, in more detail on that. But I think that's what's really cool about yoga is to me, the the non-judgmental listening is like the foundation of it so that then I can use all these different tools within a yoga practice, whether that be for connective tissue training or nervous system training or mental focus training or physical training and other ways. There's a lot of different, obviously, ways we can range of motion training. Um, anyways, there's a lot of different ways we can use this, but I think that listening is kind of the platform too. And in the context of these studies that we've talked about, both previous ones looking at hormones impacting performance, and now this one taking a different look and saying, actually, we didn't find that so much as the psychological component having more of an impact on performance um, than the hormones that was found here. Now we get to kind of open up, <laughs> open up the Pandora's box of like options and ways that you can use, um, well, different training modalities as well as yoga modalities to support your cycle and different ways that your cycle might be informing and influencing your training and performance. So yes to that. <laughs> yeah. And also just, just wanting to stress one more time that performance per se and training and listening through your, to your body throughout your training period are two different things in my opinion, because also your nervous system is going to be in a very different state when you're asked to perform be it on race day or being in a laboratory study or environment. So um, <laughs> there's probably um, an influence of that as well. So there could also be an influence of that on the study results themselves. So the stress or the situation you receive in the lab when you're asked to perform, that's that's always a very specific scenario as well. So we have to keep that in mind as well. But also... Um, yeah, it can have implications for our practice for for training um, as well. So not just for the laboratory setting. Yeah, and and so many limitations, right? <laughs> so many limitations. One, just the you know, forty people. They were just looking at very specific muscles and strength, like hand grip and biceps, and specific jumps and movements. And then, like you said, the performance in a lab versus actual performance on race day. There, there's so many moving parts. And I, I think we always like to stress this because um, even the best research isn't perfect. It just gives us a little bit of information. And I think this is where research and yoga goes so hand in hand because yoga helps us then do the internal research, do the inquiry to see what fits us, what suits us. And in the context of the female cycle, <laughs> each day, <laughs> what, what fits us, what suits us. And I think using this information, um, both on the cycle that we've talked about on previous episodes, as well as what we're talking about in this episode, um, can be a way to support that using that information to support that awareness. You know, I think one thing we love at yoga medicine is using both the brainy research and science information, as well as the experience to help inform us to ultimately, find the truth of what's helpful for us in this moment, which is always changing, especially as a female, not only throughout our cycle, but through our lifespan um, quite a bit as we're exposed to different amounts of hormones, <laughs> varying levels of hormones. So, but the psychological component is really important. And I think, you know, having that non-judgmental attention of being able to notice is so key, especially if it's race day and you can't change the day. You know, obviously you can use this quite a bit as to how you approach your training that day if you're training. But if you have a race, there's not much you can do about that. And I think like Katya said, there's the silver lining that it, it that people can still PR, you know, on these days. And it's not just the hormones and knowing that there's a psychological component means there's also something that we can grab onto the steering wheel and kind of share and steer and shift and be able to kind of turn it in the direction that might be helpful for us. Or, yeah. or if it's not race day, just cut yourself some slack, <laughs> find a way to move and you know, we know that circulation is important during the period we talk about in those past episodes and trainings, but finding a way to move that, you know, is enjoyable for you. And I think what you just said about yoga medicine, just 
holds true for every female out there, there is some more robust research now. And we love take, we, taking what we can from that research for now. And I personally am really enthusiastic about any high quality piece of research that is coming out for female athletes or on the female um, hormonal state. But also we need to listen to our bodies, to our systems. And um, it's actually one conclusion that some of those more critical studies also draw, pointing out that training, tailoring of your training should still focus mainly on your individuality. That's what some of those studies say. And that's basically the same that you just mentioned for yoga medicine as well. It's about picking some highlights from the research, seeing what we can do with that, but still focusing or or knowing that our individual experience and our field experiment of one is just the way to go because we don't know everything in the research. It's constantly evolving. We can play around with that. We can experiment with that. We can see what resonates with us. And we can also see pieces of research evolving and then also evolve our own opinion and and take on those things but we will never get around the fact that we yeah we should listen to our bodies and learn our own mo physically and mentally and and combine those things that's truly um the recipe that to me promises just the most success in terms of performance but also in experience your monthly cycle every month <laughs> <laughs> and in every other part of therapeutics, really. So, you know, it's one of the reasons I always say that I think yoga is so critical to our healthcare systems is just the listening and the awareness that it can even just give better feedback to our doctors so that we can be able to better sense and listen into how whatever treatments are impacting us, much less the therapeutic benefits of a yoga practice. <laughs> so, um, this was great. I, I I hope you guys like um, getting to dive into like a specific study. We try to put a little context in there so that you can see what's been done already in this research realm. But I think being able to dive in deeply into one study does give us some more information um, that can hopefully be useful. And again, this is a work in progress. There's still a lot of research to be done in anything related to fem female health, <laughs> pretty much across the board, especially as it relates to performance and athletic training, but a really cool area of study that we can also live in and experiment in our own bodies. So if you want more details on using yoga to train athletes. I did mention a few different ways that yoga can be helpful. There's a lot. Um, we have our yoga for athletes training that can be done online, or you can wait for it to come around in person at some point. Everything does eventually. Uh, we also have um, our female health training, teacher training um, to train yoga teachers to support the different phases of the cycle, as well as different issues that come up. Um, like for instance, we talked about PMS, period pain, things like endometriosis and polycystic ovaries and perimenopause and all of the things. So if you want more information and resources, you've got those. We mentioned the other episodes you can refer back to as well for some female health info. And I look forward to more information to come. Did you have any last, anything else you wanted to add, Katya? No. <laughs> <laughs> We'll leave you in the mystery of more to come on female health research and performance training. Thank you for joining us. And I look forward to chatting with you next time, Katya. Thank you. Till next time. <laughs>Thanks for listening to Yoga Medicine. If you like the show, please be sure to subscribe and leave a rating and review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you got something out of this episode, please spread the word and share it with a friend. You can find more information, articles, trainings, and classes at yogamedicine.com or check us out on social media as Yoga Medicine. You can also email us at info at yogamedicine.com. Thank you for being a part of our yoga medicine community. We look forward to seeing you again. The content of this podcast is not medical advice and is not meant to replace medical care. Please consult your healthcare provider to determine what is best for your unique healthcare needs.